Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock. Happy Thursday uh, to you and yours. Happy day before Friday. The weekend's almost here. Uh, and man, uh, do we have a great show for you today. Uh, it's going to be hard to top yesterday's show. Uh, my rebuttal to the State of the Union <laughs> was pretty bonkers uh, yesterday. I appreciate all of you that uh, watched and, and shared it with uh, friends and families. I, I suggest you continue to do that because uh, as I looked around, uh, that was the best explanation of the State of the Union uh, I'd seen anywhere. And, and I loved like Tucker Carlson's explanation last night. I was on his show uh, with him last night. It was good too, but I went an hour and 20 straight minutes without taking a breath and breaking down that terrible State of the Union address. Uh, that was awesome. But we're going to top it today. Uh, it's just me, you, and Art Browse. Uh, we're going to get to the bottom of the Art Browse uh, controversy. Art, uh, the great Baylor head football coach, the great Texas high school football coach, had success, a lot of success at the University of Houston, uh, then takes Baylor from the abyss to a nationally ranked program. And as you've heard me, I talk earlier this week, Monday or Tuesday, I think I did a show uh, about art and what's going on with him right now. Of course, you know, he got run out of Baylor in 2015, as we discussed earlier in the week. He and uh, several of his black football players were scapegoated for a campus-wide problem at the University of Baylor. I think anybody that looks into that case will see clearly that they had a campus-wide problem that they knew they could sweep under the rug by, hey, <laughs> no. it's those black football players in our brows. We get rid of them and we fix Baylor and don't, don't look at the rest of the school. Uh, don't file all those lawsuits uh, you're thinking about filing. Uh, don't look at the Board of Regents. Don't look at us not following federal guidelines and, and safety protocols for students as it relates uh, to reporting sexual assault. So those crazy criminal black football players, they're the problem. And Art Browse lets them just run crazy. Yeah, America fell for that. The media painted that picture. It's not remotely the truth. Many of the players that were in the headlines from Sean Oakman to, uh, uh, Oak, to others were exonerated, but the media doesn't care about that. Uh, they had a scalp and they could blame football, which the media loves to blame football. Uh, at some point, I wish people would wake up and get it, that football, the, the, the sport most attached to Christianity, most attached to traditional conservative values, is constantly under attack. And so uh, with Art being in the news, and you guys have, have followed the news cycle, I'm sure, Art was uh, going to resurface as the offensive coordinator at Grambling State University uh, under head coach Hugh Jackson. And uh, of course, the social media lynch mob went after Art. And then uh, Doug Williams, the all-time great football player from Grambling State, first black quarterback to win a Super Bowl through Art and Hugh under the bus. Uh, and so before I introduce and bring on Art, I just, I wanna say, cause if you hear me, and look, I'm going to tell you throughout this interview exactly what I believe. I've already said what I believe earlier in the week, but, but if you hear me sometimes make, measuring my words, it's because I know all the people involved, particularly in this Grambling situation, I know them and have talked to them and I respect them. I respect Doug Williams. I disagree with him uh, on this particular issue, but I respect uh, Doug Williams immensely. Um, I, I respect Hugh Jackson and you know anybody that has followed my career from writing to TV knows I have not always agreed with uh, Hugh Jackson. When he was with the Oakland Raiders, I came up with the nickname Hubris, Hubris Jackson, because you know I thought his ego had run amok. But I support Hugh Jackson, and particularly what he's doing at Grambling State, and I want him to have success. 
And I want him to have a redemption story because I think Hughes involved with football for the right reasons. And I think he's worthy of having success. And I think that Art Browse uh, could have been and would have been a tremendous as asset for Hugh and the Grambling State program and all those black football players at Grambling. And so, uh, anyway, I want to be respectful of everybody I know and my, and my relationship and ability to communicate with them. But today, I mostly just want to give you all an opportunity uh, to learn about the real Art Browse, not the media narrative, not the guy that has been uh, canceled and smeared uh, by an unobjective, bought and paid for uh, media machine. Uh, I want to give you all an opportunity to hear out of Art Browse's own mouth who he is, why he's been involved in football his entire life. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what happened at Baylor, uh, but Art, I, I, I want to start by thanking you for coming here, and and we'll start by you know just kind of take us through the news cycle. I, I think. Last week, around Wednesday or Thursday, it comes out that you're going to be the offensive coordinator at uh, Grambling. And then, is it Monday night, you put out a statement saying you don't want to be a distraction, you're going to back away. Hours earlier, Hugh had put out a statement defending you. Uh, the day before that, Doug Williams had you know, kind of taken a dump on you, and I'm sure it put a lot of pressure on uh, the people at Grambling. But in, in your mind, what happened at Grambling? Why did you choose to step away? Well, <clears throat> pleasure to be here, Jason, first of all. And, uh, you know, really to, to how it all started, I was, my wife and I were planning on going back to Italy. You know, we'd coached over there in a 28, not 18 and 19. And so we were headed back this spring. They play a spring Italian pro football league. And it's, a, it's an awesome deal, and I've really enjoyed it because it's great football. But... Hugh just called me out of the blue, you know, and said, Coach, you want to come coach at Grambling? You know, and I'd known him a little bit from when he was at Cleveland because I came up and visited him at Cleveland. He had four of our players on his team there. Uh, Corey Coleman, Josh Gordon, Robert Griffin III, and Spencer Drango were all on his team at Cleveland. So he wanted me to come up and kind of help, you know, hang out with those guys and help them get going with the Browns. And so when he called, you know, I picked it up, and he said, do you want to come to Grambling? And I'm like, Yes, sir. You know, because I, I, when I was around him at Cleveland, I felt like his heart was in the right place. And, you know, I felt like, uh, you know, he was headed in a direction with student, with athletes at that time, not student athletes, that showed some care as a person. And that's, you know, what I've always been about. So I said, yeah, I'm in. And uh, so he checked with everybody and said, Coach, you're good. So I actually went there and coached for two weeks. You know, I'd been there two weeks, and it, it was an unbelievable experience. And so when you were there that initial two weeks, it hadn't leaked out at what the people in the media didn't know? Well, yeah, he had announced it, but they hadn't announced it formally. So gotcha. I, was, I was on campus eating at the cafeteria, you know, there all day, you know, installing the offense, you know, introducing them on the field with the players, with the tennis ball, which was awesome. And these, these guys are just that, – that's, to me, the hardest part about this deal with Grandma is – it's about the student athletes, you know. I mean, I'd already formed bonds with them, and you know, I was really looking forward to, you know, going into battle with them, you know, on the football field, and uh, you know, it just just didn't end up happening that way. But it was uh, honestly two of the best weeks I've had in the last, you know, six years. It was just it was a lot of fun just getting back in the office and talking football. I, I did not realize you had been there. So you'd been there two weeks. And again, I know you're saying they hadn't formally announced it, so I guess no one had formally asked Doug Williams for his opinion. Yes, sir. Uh, were you aware during that two-week period that perhaps Doug Williams was uncomfortable or making noise behind the scenes that he was on? No, we, I, had, I had no idea. I mean, everything that I was presented with through Hugh and the athletic director was – it's all good. We did, there wasn't any chatter on the outside that, that I was aware of. I, don't, I guess they weren't either. I don't know. But, um, you know, I was, I was on campus for two weeks and, you know, there early and stayed late and having fun coaching ball. And so 
Art Browse, one of the most successful college coaches, innovative, disruptive coaches, you know, arguably in the history of college football, he's on Grambling's campus for two weeks. Did you ever have a chance to talk or meet with Doug Williams? No, sir. No, he, I never did. And so when you read comments in the paper that he wouldn't support it, you're totally blindsided or? 100%. Uh, just kind of came out of the blue. I think that happened last Friday. Yeah. And, uh, and I have a lot of respect for Doug also, like you mentioned. You know, I can, and I'm, I hope my dates right, but I think it was 1988 uh, Super Bowl. Uh, that's when he won it with the Redskins. And I'm thinking Art Monk. I don't remember who the receivers were, but they were, they're pretty dynamic. He probably threw for the high threes, low fours that game. But uh, so it, it surprised me a little bit. You know, I knew he went to Grambling. And I knew he was a coach at Grambling. Uh, but, you know, when you think about Grambling, you think about Ed Robinson. You know, and, and when I was a high school coach in Texas, I actually went to listen to Eddie Robinson. I think it was about 1993 at the AFCA convention. Front row, just because he was, you know, he was an icon. Yes. And, um, you know, got his autograph. And the thing I loved about the talk is that he talked about everything but football. You know, and that's what I loved. He talked about, you know, helping kids, raising kids, being there for them, loving them, and just giving them direction. And, uh, you know, so that resonated with me. But even it, as a high school coach back then, that's, that's what I've always been about. And it goes back to how I was brought up and what I went through early in life. So that, that really uh, stood well with me. And so I, I always, when somebody says Grambling, I smile. And it's called Eddie Robinson. So Hugh uh, shared with me that he remembers your first practice. And I didn't know he was talking about, you know, two weeks or three weeks ago or whatever when he said it. But he said, but you got very emotional after practice and was like, you've given me my life back. What, what, what was it about returning to college football and returning to Grambling? Do, do you remember that? Do you remember your first day? That is, is, he said you were nearly in tears. You were so... Probably not nearly. I probably was, you know, in a, maybe shedding one or two. Just... Just the joy and excitement of, of being back on the field in an environment that I've lived my whole life in. My father was a coach. That's that's all I've ever done. I've coached for over 40 years, and and so just being back to a place where I'm comfortable, you know, to where I feel like I can help and and serve a purpose. Uh, that that to me, and just seeing the excitement in the players and and their want to and their drive and their determination and their care. You know, all that just, it means the world to me. It, it <clears throat> and I, I don't want to, but one of the things I've expressed in my conversations with people about this is, is that the kids at Grambling had an opportunity to work with a former NFL head coach who had run some offenses in Cincinnati for Marvin Lewis, been a head coach with the Raiders, been a head coach with the Cleveland Browns. That's their head coach. And then this head coach is smart enough to realize that he's a great offensive coach, but just being completely under, you know, you coached at Baylor where there was a lot of funds and a lot of support. When you're coaching at an HBCU, there's, just, there's not a, a huge support staff. Funds are tight and there's fires to put out constantly. Not that they're not fires to put out at the other schools, but you having enough self-awareness to know that if I'm gonna have a dynamic offense, I gotta, I can't, it can't be me because of all the other responsibilities. And so he figures out a way to bring in an offensive genius. You don't have to comment on that, but clearly your resume uh, says that someone who's had a tremendous amount of success. And so the kids at Grambling were about to get the best of both worlds, a former NFL head coach and a guy that created a lot of NFL players at the collegiate level. And, and I think that's what, there was an opportunity in, to uh, give the Grambling kids the, greatest gift you can give a football player. People 
that know how to develop them at the highest level. And, and that's what I wish people, I wonder if people have lost sight of the opportunity that's being denied the kids at Grambling. I, I think you hit it right on, Jason. It really not, not just Grandma, but HBCU. You know what Dion's brought there, and Eddie George, and now you got Hugh, and and so I was honored, you know, to be a part of it. I really was, and it it was very inspiring to me. And you know, you mentioned Hugh being an offensive guy all his career, and, and it to me it showed just a lot of in, um, self confidence on his part to say, Coach, you got it. You know, I'm, I'm going to be the head coach. You're going to be the OC, and, and we're rolling. You know, so he, he let me do that. And to me, that just shows what kind of man he is. You know, what he's trying to do. He's trying to do the best for Grambin University. And that's, you know, that's what I was all about, too. And it's, um, it's just, it's, you know, it's sad that it didn't work out. It, it's, and I don't know if I want you to comment on this, but I, I, I just want to say it that I've been trying to explain to people like they were, well, and we, Stephen A. Smith, and maybe we still have that clip. Uh, we used it a couple of days ago, but Stephen A. Smith's on ESPN and saying, this is gonna go down on Hugh Jackson's legacy that at an HBCU, basically he inferred that they didn't give a black coach that job. And, and I've argued and explained to people like, well, hold on, man. The, the predominantly white schools can come in and take all the black talent they want and help their schools, but we can't take uh, one of the greatest uh, offensive minds and college coaches we've ever seen and have him come and help the black kids at the black school. So integration's only a one-way street assets going back and forth between communities is only a one-way street. Our, as, our assets go out, they get to keep their assets. And so coaching at an HBCU, what, what did, because I agree, with, Dion's created so much excitement and so much attention. I don't even think people are aware that some of these schools uh, at, at particular games are averaging 50, 60,000 people. And so you are aware that like HBCUs or football is having a, a renaissance and they're starting and you want to be a part of that. I, I did. I, I, I've always, my whole career, Jason, it's, it's been about going to places that we're going to climb, you know, from, from high school, collegiately, University of Houston and at Baylor. And this was the same scenario there for, for me, you know, as, as an inspiration because I want to see places change, I want to see people exceed, and I want to see alumni happy and proud, you know, and uh, so that, that to me was a, was a great opportunity, you know, for the university, and, um, you know, I just, I, you know, I, I, for what Hugh Jackson tried to make happen, you know, I applaud him, I really do, because in his mind, rightfully so, professionally, he was doing the right thing for those student athletes, and at the end of the day, that's, that's, that's all it's about. You know, that's, that's your legacy. Your legacy is the love and the support and the growth you put in those young student athletes as they carry on. My, my proudest moments of, co of coaching college football are first-generation graduates. That's the proudest moments I have. You know, when these, when these kids can stand there and be a college graduate for the first, first person in their family and they got a young daughter and son looking up at them some days thinking, well, if Daddy can do that, I can do it. It, it just changes generations. So that, that was, you know, my main goal, any, any college job I've ever been at. And so uh, we have a contributor on this show, great young man, uh, former University of Missouri wide receiver, uh, T.J. Moe. He played at Mizzou when you were at Baylor, I think played against you a couple of times. Uh, T.J.'s a great guy, Christian, all the right values. And, and he, he was upset that you stepped away from this Grambling situation. He, why didn't he stand there and fight, blah, blah, blah. And, and I was saying to him, like, now come on, TJ. I, I, I don't think Art quit here. I, I think Art was 
made an offer he couldn't refuse. Is, is, is that accurate? <laughs> I mean, you, you're, you're on it, Jason. I would never step away from uh, a chance to help young people, not voluntarily. And so you just took the high road by putting out that statement and, and you know, didn't want to burn any bridges or point any fingers? Didn't want Grambling to go through uh, a media flurry that uh, could be avoided. You know, that's, that's it. But, uh, you know, I, w I was very anxious and very excited and very driven to go help the Grambling Tigers and the G-Men and Coach Jackson in that university. I'll just say that. And I was presented with a situation that it looked like it was not going to happen. And so, and again, this is my thoughts. Don't attach these to anyone else. But is there a potential Hail Mary to be thrown here in terms of have, have you or Hugh reached out to Doug Williams and said, hey, man, could, could, could you and uh, uh, Coach Browse sit down and, and maybe get to know each other and see if there's not some common ground here, you can't hear his story and understand it from his perspective. H have you thought about reaching out to Doug Williams, you and Hugh Jackson perhaps? I, I know that Coach Jackson has. I know that he talked with, Hugh, with uh, Doug earlier you know, this week, and uh, I, I really don't know how it went, but I know that they spoke, and uh, yeah, certainly I would you know, talk with him at any time. Uh, you know, just to give him opportunity to ask me any questions that he wanted to ask and to get to, you know, know, know where my heart is and soul, you know. But um, so I don't know if there's a Hail Mary or not to answer, answer your question. I would always hope so. You know, you, you'd hate to always say it's over when maybe it's not over. So I'm, I've, I've learned the last few years to remain faithful and hopeful and, and, and always ready. So I'm, you know, I'm, Sitting on go. And so let's say they did circle back. You would be willing to go back to Gramley? Right now, we'd, we'd have to cut this interview short. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's work to be done. And so, you like the talent there? You thought there was some yeah, talent there? Some good, there really is. It was, it was very refreshing. And the, uh, even more than the talent, and there is some talent on campus without, without a question, is just the, the attitude you know, the work ethic. I mean, they've done a great job. Coach Jackson, Leonard, the strength coach, all those coaches are getting guys in there that are they're eager. And, you know, a lot of them are transfer guys in that just got there in December and January. And, you know, so everybody's starting fresh. And there's, there's something to that. You know, we're, everybody's going to be judged by what they do now, you know, at that place and not by what they did before. I'm, I'm certainly, when we're done with this interview, I'm going to reach out to Doug and, and try to see if, you know, because I, I just think if you, one, I think about Doug Williams, and this is to say nothing about Eddie Robinson and that staff or whatever, because they were great. But, but I, I sit around and think, like, Doug Williams has to know that if the next Doug Williams could play in Art Browse's offense? Oh my God. Uh, because I, I don't think, and, and Art, I don't, I don't know how closely you were able to follow Doug's pro career, but Doug Williams was John Elway. He just, you know, ended up going to the expansion, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and, you know, he had some success there, but, you know, and then he went off to the USFL, and blah, blah. But just in terms of, I'm not sure if anybody, had more talent than Doug Williams. And again, it, talent is great, but you gotta land in the right situation to maximize that. And, and so I just, kids like Doug Williams playing in your offense win Heisman trophies. We've seen that. <laughs> right on, you're right. That's, that's true, that's a fact. Yeah, <laughs> and so. <laughs> Would have had a few more if I could have hung around a little longer there too. Yeah, we had some guys that were talented enough to do it. Huh. So I, I, I'm gonna do my best to see if, because I, I, I would. I mean, your offense at Grambling, 
with the excitement that Dion has created. Uh, you know, Eddie George trying to get Tennessee, Tennessee State rolling right here in Nashville. There's so much momentum and, and an exciting uh, offense with, with huge. It would just be an incredible story. But OK, so I got a little bit of an understanding of, of what happened at Grambling. I, I think what people at Grambling or Doug Williams or critics of, of Art Browse, we, we need to unpack what happened at Baylor. Now, I've done a lot of the unpacking because over the past two years, I've looked very closely at your case. And when uh, I was with OutKick, uh, we published a story. Uh, Jason King did uh, the reporting on it and I edited it and we put it out under w with Clay Travis and and from from my perspective I, I they don't have any proof that you did anything wrong all they have is a social media narrative that bad things were happening at Baylor and the football coaches and black players were blamed I, again I, I the report from Pepper Hamilton, a hundred or more sexual assault allegations, five of them involved. 417 to be exact. 417? Yeah. And they chose five that happened to be African American football players that they presented to the Board of Regents. And so it's so clear cut that they took a stereotype and covered up a campus-wide problem. Is that not what happened? Yeah, it's 100% correct. It was campus-wide issue all the way across the board. And to, to keep the, the university, to keep the brick and mortar in place, uh, they, the select few board, board members, there's 33 people on the board, all white. There was one African-American that resigned during that time. Uh, but they're all, they're all selected appointed. They're not voted on, so they handpick who they want to be on the board. And the three or four running at that time uh, just got to where they wanted the narrative to be that it was a football issue. And by terminating me and firing me, then everything would be okay at Baylor University. And so they paid a lot of money to a PR firm to, to start that narrative. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's basically where we are today. It's, you know, I've, I've got a letter of exoneration from Baylor University Council saying I never covered anything up, never did not report an incident, never met with a victim, alleged victim. Uh, I've got an exoneration letter from Byrd and somebody independent investigation out of Austin and Byrd independent investigation out of Atlanta that did one. Then I got cleared through the NCAA that I had there were no violations. They, they had a five and a half year investigation. Baylor University flew to NCAA May the 25th, Wednesday, on Dan Hoard's private plane. And what year? 2016. I was, gotcha. I was terminated May 26, 2016. They flew there May the 25th, the day before they terminated me, and went to the NCAA and tried to paint the picture that it was a football issue. For two reasons. First of all, to you know, not make it campus-wide, and it's a shame that it is a campus-wide situation. I mean, that's that's a shame. And so I'm those other 412 allegations. I mean, should be investigated for the the sake of the victims involved. And then the other reason is, if they find an NCAA violation on me, they don't have to pay me. Uh, so they flew up there the night before they terminated me with that intention. And so I, I, the media that loves to talk about systemic racism and institutions that are out of control are looking at a small Baptist university, that private, private university that 
uh, has the same problem. And I, I really don't want to scapegoat Baylor. I, I, I'm not, I, I really don't because that's a college wide problem. Mm -hmm. Young people, alcohol, drugs, pornography that's so pervasive now. It's a Molotov cocktail for sexual assault. And it's a college wide problem. I can remember when I was a student at Ball State as athletes, we would complain about how we're stereotyped or we're blah, blah, blah. But there were specific rules and guidelines girls were told about going into the fraternity houses on campus. And they were all white fraternity houses. And, you know, don't go alone. Don't go to the bathroom alone, blah, 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 because the sexual assault was so rampant. And, and as one of your lawyers pointed out, I think in a court deposition or whatever, it's like they had a problems at Baylor on their fraternity, in their fraternity houses or whatever, but whoever the head of those fraternities are, they're not getting fired. They're not getting pointed out and scapegoated for what the kids in that fraternity did or have done. But when it comes to football, uh, you know, Art Browse, basically uh, assisted in the sexual assault or whatever. It, it's, it's crazy and I, I just, I don't understand why a media that considers itself woke and out to challenge power fail for the, oh yeah, it's just that one guy and it's those black football players clean that up. But, but, but this is one thing I will say and this is a um, it's just a cold assessment. Given the stakes, having 400, you, you bring in an investigator firm, they put together a report that paints the picture of this campus-wide problem. If, if, if they don't scapegoat you, it could cost them the entire university. I don't think I'm exaggerating that. Not at all. I mean, it, it had to start and stop somewhere. And I, I have a lot of strong feelings for Baylor University, the people at that university, the students, student athletes I got to come into contact with for eight and a half years are just unbelievable people, great people. Uh, I, th I think the, the regions that were appointed uh, were weak in the category of understanding uh, social media pressure. I don't think they'd ever been in leadership positions. And I think they uh, you know, got information that they thought they could you know, put out there that would stop the problem. But, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a sad turn of events in that they, they dodged the bullet instead of taking the bullet. I mean, to me, you stand up and you say, we've got a campus-wide problem. We don't have pop, proper policies and procedures. We don't have Title IX. Our first Title IX got there in the fall of 2015. The coaches on campus had their first Title IX meeting in person in June or July of 2016 after I was already terminated. So the, the, the students, the training was, was not there campus-wide. And uh, that to me is, is the biggest travesty because that, you're there to protect them. You know, it's asinine to think that I would cover up somebody, you know, ha have an assault on somebody, know about it, not do anything about it. I mean, that, that's asinine. Nobody would ever do that. I wouldn't do it. But that's, that's an image that's out there. But why would Baylor write me an exoneration letter saying that I never did that? Because I never did. Why would an independent, independent investigation say that? Because it never happened. Why would the NCAA work five and a half years and try to find something of an NCAA violation and, and clear me? I mean, so that's, that's a real picture. And, um, but like I said, that's, that was the, the lead that those few people took on the Regents at that time. And, and my other thing, like, if you were this monster that social media and portions of the media want to paint you as, and, and if Baylor knew you were this monster, why did they give you all your money? Why did they pay you? Well, you, you don't pay guilty. You know that and I know that, Jason. So I don't know, you know, and uh, that's, that's for them to answer um, because they fired me without cause, bottom line. And if, if it was such a culture issue, you know, that, that this is within our football program. Well, 
first of all, everybody else on the staff remained in coach through the next season, and, and a bunch of them could have stayed there and kept on coaching. And I'd, I'd never even heard the word culture until, you know, the investigation that Pepper Hamilton had. But they never interviewed one single player. They never came to practice field and watched us work out. They never walked through the halls. They never came to a weight training session. And so how, how do you develop a culture, understand a culture if you're not around somebody and living with them and dealing with them on a daily basis? I mean, you can't. I mean, we led the graduation rate in the Big 12 first or second every year I was there. 2016, we had the highest GPA in the football history of the university. So it's, uh, we're graduating players. We're taking care of business. And we're going to have, you know, some things come up like every university does, and you deal with it. And that's what we did. All right, I, I can relate. And, I, you know, I wish I'd had your contract at, at Baylor. But, you know, I can remember in uh, 2015 when uh, ESPN uh, failed to properly deal with me. Uh, and they painted the picture that I was the problem and work with the media and blah, blah, blah. But what, what ends up happening in a lot of these situations is when they know they've done someone wrong who's done nothing wrong, they cut you a check. And so it, it, it's like I said, I wish I had your contract, but you know, I can remember ESPN giving me a $3 million check because they ushered me out the door for doing nothing wrong. Yep. And, and they do that to ease their own conscience. Well, we gave them money. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Jason, I know you're the host, but you know and I know it's not about the money. Right. You know, it's, it's about the, the name, the spirit, the drive, the, you know, I, I feel like I, God put me on earth to coach. I mean, that's, that's the way I feel. That's, that's my duty to God is to coach. And so money doesn't replace that. You know, it didn't matter to me right now where I coach, just like I coached high school for two years. And in East Texas, had a blast, went to Italy, coached a year, and going back next week unless something changes and coach over again. So I, I'm just, I'm a football coach, that's what I do. And you know, their actions that were taken have prevented me from doing it at, at a level that I think I can make, make the most difference at, which is at a collegiate level. Well, the other thing that I think people don't understand is, uh, your name is carried by your kids and your wife, mm -hmm. and and your kids will have kids and the brows and and they've dirtied up your name, and and uh, I was talking to someone yesterday uh, about your son Kendall who's having a lot of success, but uh, I uh, I was talking to someone about a, a different job at a different school that considered Kendall and someone there objected. We all oh, browse. Well, <laughs> well, this is his son. But, but so when they do this, there's no check that can be cut that's worth more than your name. No, sir. No, sir. And, and, and you know, I'm not going to call names because I get the thinking, but I've, me and our staff uh, this week have, have, talk to and or heard stories about, you have former players that love you, know exactly who you are, know that you've been wronged, but they're scared to death that if they come out and tell the truth about you, they'll get smeared. And we've created a system where people can't tell the truth and they can't defend good people that the social media mob and the media mob have branded inappropriately and wrongly uh, to where it, it, it's, it, it's, I, I, <laughs> cause I can relate to all of this. I, I, and I'll tell the story here, but, but it's like, I would imagine there are some people like, oh, I don't want to take a picture with Art Browse. You know, the, if I put that all over social media, you know, then I got to deal with Art Bros. I, I deal with that myself and for, you know, a different set of reasons, but I've been smeared and dirtied up. Uh, I can remember. Uh, Some people don't like the truth, Jason. <laughs> if, if you don't like the truth, it means you got something wrong. I was. The truth bothers you. 
I was on the sidelines a few years ago uh, at uh, Arizona State uh, bowl game in Las Vegas. I was on Arizona State's sidelines. A friend of mine at the time uh, was working at one of the shoe companies or whatever. And I know Herm Edwards, yeah. several people on his staff or whatever. There was an ESPN personality that was also on the sidelines that when I showed up for the second half, he went, he was so afraid to just even be around me. He went to the other end of the field and never came back and engaged with people he had been engaged with. <laughs> and, we, and, we, and so this world we've set up that's so hostile to the truth uh, is frightening, but, but I, I would just imagine what the price it's taken on your, on your kids and your name, that, that's what I'm sure hurts you the most. What well, 1,000%, and there's no, there's no price that you can put on it. And I, and I even relate it to my dad's name, you know, because that's, that's the name that I live under. And uh, so that's, you know, that's been the horrible aspect because for all my career and all my life, I'd always been known as an honorable, fair, honest, loyal, trustworthy person. Then all of a sudden, that whole image gets gone in a, in a heartbeat. But the, you know, the other, the other side of it, to me, it's, uh, it's invigorating, you know, because I'm, I'm not going to let, you know, people think something of me that that's not true and it's not right and just run off and hide, hide in the corner. You know, I mean, I'm going to, I love the coach. I, I think I'm a really good football coach and I think I can help young people. So I'm going to continue chasing that. I may be the oldest coach in, in America here in, you know, 15 years, but that's okay. You know, I mean, I actually coached 26 ball games as a head coach in 20, 2019 or 2018 and 2019. You know, I coached 13 in Italy and 13 in America. I got back from Italy July 6th and started the high school job in Mount Vernon, Texas on August the 1st. You know, so it was, it was awesome, you know, and that's, uh, that's what makes me happy. And so I'll, I'll keep working to do what I, what I love to do and what I know that I can help people with. And at the end of the day, your actions will speak louder than words and people judge you by your actions. Did at any point you and your wife or you and your lawyer, the wrongful termination lawsuit you filed against Baylor, mm -hmm. did anybody suggest to you, ah, just take the money settlement and the, the termination suit perhaps elevated the attack from the Board of no Regents. Question. Do you regret filing that suit? I, I do now, yes sir. Uh, now we never did actually follow through with filing it because yep. I pulled, I backed off of it a couple of days before because I actually thought I was going to get a job with Anthony Lynn out in San Diego at that time because Anthony I've known for a long time. He's from Salina, Texas, great guy and a great football coach, great man. And so I thought I was going to be in on that. So we kind of backed off for that reason and then just because the people that were associated at Baylor University at that time were all out trying to find jobs and get going and they're, ha they're having a hard time. They all, most of them had to kind of come back and restart, uh, nearly all of them, basically. And uh, so I thought by doing that, it would just put more media attention out there and make it harder for them to, you know, take care of their families and, and do what they love to do. So I, that's, that's the reason we decided not to end up filing it. So, and I don't, I'm not a thousand percent sure of the timeline, but at some point, the Board of Regents hires the San Francisco-based public relations firm, J.G. Bunting, and that's when uh, they work with the Wall Street Journal and a reporter there with ties to Baylor and administrators at Baylor, and they come out with that you know, story from out of nowhere. Oh, it was 17 players. Yeah. And it was all a lot of speculation. Some of it was based off of, well, a reporter at ESPN said on TV this or that. Uh, and so you're a football coach and then you get this like 
uh, microwaved, high-level education on how the media works and how like what, and so I, I, how eye-opening has it been for you to learn how the media actually works? <laughs> you know, I, I, the media had always been, you know, I, I've never been a media attention seeker. You know, because I just, I mean, when I coached actively, I, w I didn't go to the grocery store. You know, I just coached football. And so, you know, when all that stuff is breaking, um, it's just, you know, it, it, it numbs you, honestly. You know, I, I, had, I had no idea. And it's still, it's still numbing. You know, and, and, you know, so that's just, uh, like you mentioned, that's the world that we live in. Uh, you know, I've come from the, the old school you know, you trust somebody, you're loyal to them, you shake a hand, you tell your word, it, it's your bond. Um, you judge people by their character um, and how they act and what they do, not by what they say or how they look. I mean, that's just the way that I, that I was raised and that's the way I've always operated. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm proud to say that personally, I've never had any, out of 40 something years of being in the public business, you know, never had any anything directed toward me as anything being inappropriate with anybody, but that, that doesn't matter in the media world. You know, at this time it doesn't seem like, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna judge something by what we perceive it to be instead of what it is. I saw a story in USA Today this week from a guy named Dan Wolken. He writes a lot about college sports. The headline was something about, you know, Grambling Learn, that Art Browse is forever radioactive. And, and, and I, I just, I was like, how can you comfortably from your home talk about someone and frame someone like that, that you don't know and clearly you, you haven't done the homework on? Uh, it just, it, it, it infuriates me. It, 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 it burns me up. Forever radioactive for, and basically, I, I think your worst crime would have to be at Baylor that when one of your players was accused of something, you didn't immediately say, well, you must be guilty, we're done with you, we'll run you out of the program. You, you actually, you know, trying to be loyal and live up to your word to the players, that's your worst crime. And I, I'm not, I wouldn't direct you to do anything differently. And, and again, I, I don't know all the particular, but I, I do know if the standard you're being held to, every coach in college football at some point would be in jeopardy of being, being fired. And, and it's, it's got to be frustrating to have been in the game as long as you have, made as many friends in the profession, both players and coaches, and to have people like Anthony Lynn and Hugh Jackson and others uh, that know you, want to work with you, yeah. but they can't. That's, that's got to be painful for them and for you. Oh, it's extremely painful. You know, and forever is a strong word. I, I hate that he used that word because that's, that's into infinity. But that's, you know, that's an opinion and that's based off of, of not knowing me personally and, and maybe not knowing the situation with all the knowledge that's out there. But, yeah, it's, uh, you know, there, I, there's been many people that would have liked to have hired me and I would have loved to have been on their staff and served in any capacity over the last few years, but it, it just, you know, it, it was never gonna happen. So I'm, I'm gonna remain hopeful, Jason, I really am, uh, because that's how I've always operated. I'm gonna remain faithful, and like I mentioned, I'm gonna remain ready. I wanna talk about your faith and why you talk about remaining faithful, and, and again, there was, I didn't have some long preview interview with uh, Art. And so a lot of things you're saying, just like how you talked about how uh, Anthony Lynn wanted to bring you onto the Charger staff. I, I, I had no idea about that. 
but this, you know, from Hugh Jackson to Anthony Lynn, it, it seems <laughs> your connection with black athletes and coaches seems really strong. <laughs> Why is that? I think, like I mentioned, the way I was raised. I mean, I think people can see truth, they can see fair, and, and they can see hard. And that's, you know, I've always judged people from inside out. And uh, that's because that's why I wanted to be judged. You know, so I've, I've just, uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a you know, God-fearing family that, that, you know, raised me correctly, uh, put my thoughts in the right place uh, back before cell phones, if you, people won't be able to believe it, you know, that didn't happen until the mid-80s or late 80s. You know, so we, we grew up in a, a time where when somebody told you something, uh, you know, you need to kind of believe it or check it out some other way. You just couldn't, like today, kids don't really need grandparents. And if they want to believe their parents, they can, but they, all they got to just pick up the phone and Google it and see whether that's right or wrong. You know, back then you had to, you had to actually believe somebody and trust somebody. And uh, so That's I just. That's an interesting think, point that I've never thought about. Yeah. That, is, that does kind of undermine faith in each other. Yeah. It, it's, you did have to believe with your. They had a knowledge and a wisdom that you relied on that we're less relying on now because we rely on our cell phones. Yeah. I mean, there's one thing money can't buy, and that's experience. You know, you got to live it love it, taste it, feel it. And that's, so there's still value in people that have, you know, live certain events in their life and that can help others through those events. And so that's, that's always kind of been my goal. And, and I've always, you mentioned the African-Americans, you know, I've always, you know, went to University of Houston back in the 70s, back when Coach Yeoman was one of the few recruiting black athletes. I mean, he was one of the first. And, uh, you know, so I, I played with a lot of, you know, young black athletes back then. And then, you know, just wherever your career takes you, you're always, you know, there. But I've, I've never really looked at it, you know, as a, as a black-white deal. I've just always, when I'm playing or coaching, and it's funny you mentioned the deal earlier about uh, at Baylor, you know, one of the questions I got asked in the interview by Pepper Hamilton was, why do you have so many black players on your football team? And I just, you know, I should have got up and left the room. That's what I should have done, but we had no counsel. And I just said, you know, really, I've never even noticed that. I've never even thought about it. To me, they're just student athletes. And that's, that's just it. That's the honest and goodness truth. So I think people see that and, can, and judge you by, you know, how you respond to them. And to answer, to answer your question earlier. Your faith, was that's up, your, your mom and dad raised you up in the church. You, walk me through a little bit about just that and just really had to rely on it. And, and Jason, we, you know, I, I know you touched on it earlier uh, in maybe an interview or something, but, you know, my, when I was at University of Houston, my parents would come and watch us play at a, a game at SMU along with my who was my grandmother, Tati was her name. My mother's mother passed at her childbirth and her, she never knew her dad. So this, her sister raised my mother. There was a, a big age difference between them. And so she was like my grandmother. But anyway, my mother, father, and, and Tati were, you know, headed to watch us play SMU October 16th, 1976. And, you know, got, I mean, had a head on with the truck coming across the line and, and they all perished. And, you know, back then you didn't, no, nobody knows. You know, I mean, we, you know, we played the game and, and I always would look up, you know, when games, my parents were there, I'd look up and try to find my, you know, find my mom because there's always, a, as you know, a section where the yep. players' parents sit. You know, so I look, I can remember looking up there at the Cotton Bowl, you know, before the game, kind of glancing up. Nothing, you know, you know, because you usually, you know, high art, you know, or something. And um, but <clears throat> of course they weren't there. And then, you know, after the game, Coach Yeoman called me back in the room and just told me, 
you know. And so it just hits you. And there's, you know, there's two ways you can go. I mean, there's, you know, that's, that's the way I looked at it. And um, I thought I can just, you know, I can shut it down, stop, you know, and have an excuse. Or I can, uh, you know, live, live through my parents, try to make them proud and, uh, you know, use God as my, as my guider. And, you know, you know, I wasn't perfect, of course. You know, I mean, I, you know, I actually became academically ineligible during, after that. Had to transfer to Texas Tech, tore my ACL. And so I've always, since that time, tried to pay real close attention to kids that have had problems in their families, uh, going through a, a severe injury, just like Robert tore his ACL in 2009. And, you know, I, I was real, you know, in cue with how he was feeling, you know, emotionally and, and everything, because it's, it, it, that, just something like that is tragic to a young person, because that's their life, you know, football at that time. But having God in my life and, and giving me the strength to, to look past that time to a future, it's like Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, I, there, I, I will not let you hurt and I will give you hope for a future is the way I interpret it. And, um, you know, so that's what's allowed me to, to sit here today and, and try to live, you know, for my, my dad's name. He, you know, he joined the Navy as soon as he got out of high school. And- um, That's his dog tag? Yeah, yes, sir. Stayed four years in the Navy, then came back and graduated when he was 26, let the Navy pay for his school. And my mother had two kids and graduated when she was 30 and taught special needs children, you know, her until she perished. And, and so, you know, they were both first generation graduates. And so I, you know, both of them came from families with, you know, five plus kids. And uh, so back then education was, was your ticket, you know, it was your way. And that's what they did. And, you know, then my dad started coaching junior high and ended up going back to where him and mother grew up from rural Texas, where I graduated from and he finished up there. So I could imagine, because a lot of people talk about faith, family, and football, and that there's a family within football. And so I can, listening to the story about your parents and them passing while you were in college, I could easily imagine football, coaches, teammates, became a big part of your family. And- Save my life, honestly. I mean, the co Coach Todd and, you know, two or three other coaches, Moon Mullins, Larry French, Coach Elman, and then all, all the players. I'd go to, you know, Christmas with them, Easter with them. Um, you know, so it, it, we just became a family. And, and so it really taught me how you need people, you know, to, to help you. Uh, nobody can do it alone. I think it's helped me strangely, you know, in my coaching career to where I've always tried to give, empower people and, and give them a chance to, to bring what they can bring to the table and just, you know, all work together instead of, you know, working for me or, you know, would have been working for Hugh, you know, I, he, he has that quality too. So, um, you know, it just, it takes, takes a lot of people to make it work right for the young people. And that's, that's what I always cared about. And so I, I think the natural empathy you would have for a lot of kids that get involved with football because football's a really tough sport and it's really played best a lot of times by kids that don't have a lot of other options. It's, it's kind of like boxing. Yep. Again, kids from two parent suburban families that getting three meals a day and all the new clothes they can wear generally don't box. <laughs> wow. yeah. Boxing hurts. Yeah, that's, yeah, getting up in the morning and running oh. five miles, or, all that, yeah. And football has that element as well. And so you're dealing with a lot of kids that come from tough background, but you can relate. And now I'm starting to understand these bonds and connections you have with these players and, and how, and I've tried to explain to a lot of athletes they're for coaches, 
football becomes their ministry, th their way of serving God in a fun way, in a way that fits their natural instincts and talents, uh, doesn't feel like work, and, and that's, I, I, I try to tell athletes all the time, like, hey man, uh, you know, they're demonizing all these people in football and the coaches and so-called conservatives or whatever, but that was probably your little league coach. He was some conservative Christian guy that wanted to help you because he thought that's what God wanted him to do. And, and you know, listening to your story, it, it sounds like, particularly when it, you were a long time high school coach, high school coaching is not about the money and fame, even in the state of Texas. And it's about helping kids. And, and starting your football ministry. And that's why Tony Dungy had so much success. That's why Vince Lombardi had so much success. And I think that's why you had so much success. It's, uh, yeah, it's big, no, no question, because it's, it's certainly not about the money. It never is, you know, never was with me. And you mentioned never worked. You know, I don't feel like I ever worked a day in my life. I was, you know, always excited and, you know, energetic to go and, you know, see what could happen today to make, you know, football better, make some kid better, or just make our situation better. Uh, but, you know, I actually started at a, I actually started coaching before I graduated from college because I graduated in August with the summer term. And I was taking a class, I was at Texas Tech because that's where my wife was. And we started dating in high school and she was at Tech. So I went up there and we ended up getting married in 78, but this was in the summer of 79. And, uh, so we had a little part or a duplex there in Lubbock, two hundred dollars a month bills paid. So that's hard to beat, Jason. <laughs> we, it's all good. Well, that was actually nice in Lubbock. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so I, you know, I started there and um, just, you know, worked up from there and, and just because I started really at a class A, a school, which is the smallest level, and just uh, you know got got rolling from there and and the, you know the Lord has blessed me and I understand that. So I've I feel blessed. I feel blessed today. I truly do. I mean, I, I feel like I'm a very blessed man. We're going to pause because I think, I've, I've, one, I want to uh, let you wipe your tears away and, and I can wipe mine away as well. Uh, <laughs> and I, I want to just talk a little football. You've had such an interesting coaching career and touched so many different coaches and players. And, and so there's a lot more to talk about than just the, you know, unfair treatment uh, that, you, that the media has, has done. And so uh, before we go, though, I want to tell you guys about CB Distillery. Uh, your headquarters for CBD products should be our new friends from CBDistillery.com with over 2 million customers. They are the source that I trust the most. Some benefits of using CBD are it helps the body recover after physical activity, it improves the quality of your sleep, and it can also provide you with a little peace and calm during your busy day. More than 90% of doctors say their patients have used CBD to help treat and improve their health. If you haven't discovered the power of CBD, you're missing out. Go to cbdistillery.com where, where you order online with no prescription required and enter the code FEARLESS for 20% off. Not available in Idaho, Iowa, and South Dakota. Enter Fearless for 20% off at cbdistillery.com. All right, welcome back. Still joined by uh, Coach Art Browse. You know, Art, I was just looking at my Twitter feed. We put out uh, a picture of you and, and uh, you and Uncle Jimmy. And someone uh, made the point that had crossed my mind. Were you dyeing your hair when you were a football coach? <laughs> Only my hairdresser knows. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I t Uncle Jimmy, he's something else. I told him, you're taking a picture with me so you can look good. <laughs> That's why people take pictures with me today, because I make them look better. <laughs> well, I, I, wanna, I actually like you with the gray hair. It makes you, to be honest with you, I think it makes you look younger. That's what, uh, one of the first comments I made. I'll like, take it. Yeah, it looks like uh, Luke Bryan's older brother. 
Uh, the, anyway, younger, younger brother, older, older, older brother. Okay, older right, brother, that's older brother. I, I, look, I may run into Luke again, that's so fair. I got to be careful here. Uh, we're going to be joined by a, a special guest, a former Baylor Bear, the number two overall pick in the NFL draft in 2009. Uh, he didn't quite win the Heisman Trophy, uh, but Jason Smith was probably as good as anybody that played at Baylor, uh, and wow. that in includes the great RG3. Uh, you know, maybe I got a bias because I'm an off a former offensive lineman, uh, but uh, Jason played for uh, Jason Smith played for Coach Browse uh, in 2008. Uh, Jason, uh, welcome to the uh, Fearless Army and our, our show. Uh, somehow they call you smooth. Uh, I would call you Big Smith, but you know, you, how'd you get the name, nickname Smooth? That's all Coach Browse keeps talking about. How'd you get that nickname? Um, I would say it's a combination of things. Can you hear me good? Yeah, I got you now. Okay, perfect. A uh, combination of life, and I uh, kind of got the name when I was in high school. And somehow it followed me to college, and it just became, even to this day, that's what the football world still calls me. They call me actually now Big Smooth. So um, I like it. It's a good name. Well, uh, Big Smooth, one of the reasons we wanted to have you on the show, to be quite honest with you, is because of your Christian faith. And obviously you were a great player at Baylor, and you got to uh, play with Coach Art Browse. But because of your faith, one of the things – I wanted to talk to you about was the culture and your relationship with Coach Browse and how did his faith and your faith uh, play into the closeness that you guys developed, even though you only played for, for, for one year. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the culture and your relation at, at Baylor when you were there and, and, and your relationship with Coach Browse? So <clears throat> to um – to explain it where it's comprehensible, um, I went to college obviously at the age of 18, and I was there for four years before I ever met Coach Browns. And just to point blank, I, I didn't want to play for him. I was ready to leave. I loved Coach Morris. Um, but then when Coach Browns called me and we ended up meeting face-to-face -face and we talked, uh, there were a lot of things that I discovered about myself that I was lacking that Coach Browse, he, he spotted about me first. Uh, number one, I was, I wasn't, I didn't have a strong Christian faith. And that was one of the things he challenged me about was being a better person. Um, I grew up in a church in Dallas and things like that, but I had a lot of flaws. Um, I was a cusser, I was a fighter, I was a drinker. And uh, Coach Browse just told me that in order for me to be a good man one day and have a wife and have kids and have a family and take care of my grandmother and my mother and, and be able to be the example that our football team needed and my family was going to need and the world was going to need, uh, he had told me that it just wasn't going to be acceptable. Um, he was the first person to ever punch me for getting into a fight. I got into a fight at practice one time, and I believe there was 13 NFL scouts there. And uh, he pulled me out, and uh, he, I was able to play in the game. But after that game, I had to clean the whole Floyd Casey Stadium. Uh, he just raised a raised a standard of life for me that to this day, you know, I have a seven-year-old son, and we're still talking about the same principles. Um, I grew up in a family, a home where, where you know, all I saw was alcoholism. Uh, everybody drinking alcohol. It was kind of the standard of our home. And. Um, Coach Browse walked right up to me and said, you know, if you want to make it to the NFL, if you want to be a great football player, you need to stop drinking. And that was, I just cut, stopped drinking Coke right there, boom. So there were a lot of things that he was showing me and developing in me of godly character. And then I remember the, uh, he brought a, he brought a godly a chaplain in, Coach, uh, his name was Wes Urey. And he didn't make it mandatory, but he just explained to us that if you want to really develop a, a Christian character, if you want to develop into the man that God wants you to be, you guys need to go to FCA. You guys need to be around where, you know, the, the biblical teachings are being taught. And so, you know, obviously I went on after Baylor and went to the NFL, but the main thing I, I did was I stayed in church. Uh, I, went, I moved to Fairfield. I found a church. that I got married um, real fast, actually. Uh, five dates, no pre -dump. And to this day, I've been married 12 beautiful years. I'm a seven-year-old son, a four-year, I mean, sorry, seven-year-old son, a four-year-old daughter. And there's just a lot of little things like that where 
if Art Browse, coach, excuse me, coach Art Browse would have never gotten into my life, I never would have looked at life that way. I would have went on and just been another statistic, I believe, uh, coming from Baylor. The other thing he told me was I had to get my degree. Those were some of the things that he talked to me about. Like, you can't leave yet because you don't have your degree. You can't leave yet because you're not made yet. Um, he brought Coach Clement, Randy Clements in, Coach Koskazadi in. There were other men around us that just supported that theory. Hope that kind of answered that question. Whew, uh, <laughs> yeah, awesome. he's, he's, he's the best. He's real. He's no, real. Yeah, you answered the question. Coach Browse, it, it, and you and I had talked about this earlier this week. Part of the reason, one of the advantages of coaching at Baylor, a Baptist private university, is probably as a coach, you were more free to talk about your faith with your team. No question. And it, quite honestly, when, when I got there, and uh, by the way, hello, Smooth. <laughs> Good to see hey, you, coach, man. You look awesome. Good to see you. Love you, Coach. <laughs> You're the man. I don't want to arm wrestle you. But <laughs> anyway, when I got to, got to Baylor, I thought, you know, because when I went to Houston, I hired a, a chaplain, Mikado Henson, who's now at Texas A&M. And, um, and so I, when I got to Baylor, I thought, well, shoot, they're going to have five or six. Well, we get there, and there's, they don't have anybody. There's no chaplain. And, and I'm like, well, these, you know, these kids need somewhere they can go and talk and, and learn about God and, and talk to somebody in an unpressured atmosphere. And so I'd been to some chaplain meetings at the, NC, at the AFCA convention, and a guy I was really high on was Wes Sheary, who uh, Jason just mentioned. And coincidentally, he was a Baylor grad. I didn't even know it. But when I got there, I got Ian McCall, who was our AD, asked him if I could hire him. He said, sure, let's go. So got him there, and then he ended up hiring a couple others once we were there. But, you know, it was just, it's a need. You know, there's a difference between needs and wants, and, and that's a need. And it's a need that helps young people. And the thing about, you mentioned being at a, a private school as opposed to public, you know, I'd never been to private school before until I went to Baylor. And, you know, you, you can express your faith more. I mean, if you're at a public institution now and even high school, you know, some high schools, uh, you know, like, like, like we've talked throughout the program, I mean, you, you have to be guarded sometimes in what you say uh, because of the offense that it might, how it might offend other people. But everywhere I've been, fortunately, you know, we've, you know, say the Lord's Prayer, you know, and... Uh, People aren't afraid to profess their faith. Jason, uh, could you talk about, you've, you've shared your own personal relationship and the impact art had on you individually. How about the rest of the team? You're a super talented guy, going to be the second overall pick in the draft. Did you see Coach Browse and his staff with maybe players not as talented as you and, and their impact in the kind of culture and environment they set for the rest of the team? Well, th think, re remember this. Um, you know, when, when Coach Browse first got to Baylor, I had on paper a third-round grade, so I really wasn't the first-rounder until uh, a few things happened. Number one, um, there was a transformation that took place within me. Uh, if you think about, there's some scripture that says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so what Coach Browse did for myself and uh, the whole team was uh, he dug real deep into our, uh, our spirit, our soul, and our body and changed the whole makeup of the man. So Jason Smith, you know, I had Jordan Hervey, John Jones, uh, Chris Griesenbeck, J.D. Walton, James Bernard, Dan Gay. Uh, you know, Robert Griffin comes in as a 16-year-old. Uh, uh, he should have been in high school still. <laughs> and he came in the Baylor on campus. And here we are. You know, we are already with Coach Browse. And now he comes in. And the first thing he wants to do, you know, although his parents were around and ran a tight, tight, a tight ship on him, well, he and I lived in the same apartment complex. So I saw one or two things that we weren't going to go for. And so, you know, we just grabbed them real fast and nipped that in the bud. Hey, we're not going to, you know, with all due respect, we're not going to go hang out like this with, with girls. We're not going to go party like come in late like this. We got a, we got a standard we're upholding. We have new expectations. Um, it just spreads throughout the culture. And, and you got guys that, you know, just, just to be 100% transparent, you know, I had a guy that I played with. He put something on Facebook uh, about Coach Browse, you know, three days ago. And I just asked him, I said, you know, 
are you meaning that towards Coach Browse? He says, yeah, that, not towards you, towards him. And I say, hey, I'll, I'll give you a call because, you know, in reality, that guy didn't receive the transformation. That guy, his mindset didn't change. So therefore, he stayed in the same reality loser mentality of life instead of evolving into a great man. And now, you know, he has a, a history and a pattern of these these things in life that just mess up. You know, you start getting kids out of wedlock. You you don't get married. You know, I'm not judging them. I'm just saying that the standard and the culture that uh, from I learned and the uh, men around me learned, you know, there were guys now getting married. There were guys going to starting families. There were guys getting into coaching and they were following this path that Coach R. Browse had gave them. Hey, you may not go out and play football. You know, but here's a path for you as a man. You know, you need to have a family. Coach Browse has a family. You need to get, you need to get married. Coach Browse is married. You need to have kids. Coach Browse has kids. You need to have good son-in-laws and, and good daughter-in-laws. Coach Browse has that. You know, he has grandkids. So what I'm saying is uh, Coach Browse showed us what it is to be a father, a husband, and a football coach. And these are the kind of men that we're putting in the world from Baylor. Because what happens is, and this is at any institution. Uh, for me, I didn't have a father at home. So I was raised by a mother and a grandmother. Well, they can't be a father. It takes coaches. You know, from high school, Coach Billy Thompson, Coach uh, Jacob Ramon at Hillcrest and Dallas Jesuit. And then you go into college, it was Coach Wesley McGriff, Coach Morris, then Coach Browse. So, you know, every phase of you developing as a man, well, then what did our Coach R. Browse give you? He gave you the whole thing. So he gave you the strength coach. He gave you the position coaches. He gave you the chaplain. He gave you the uh, academic uh, followings. You know, okay, there's a difference between having tutors and then checking to make sure your guys are going to tutoring. And if they're not going to them, holding their hand and coming and sitting with them and tutoring. There's a difference between saying, hey, you're supposed to go eat or, or coaches coming and showing up and eating with you and then sh- sharing personal experiences with you while you're eating. You know, that, that's what changed me. That's what changed the culture. That's what changed. And it's not just in, in the fruits of the reward or – in Waco, you know, Baylor wasn't Baylor. It is now when I was there, you know, the fruits of Coach Browse changing young men and then bringing young men in. Uh, you know, you drive down 35 and you see a big McLean Stadium. Uh, you drive on campus, you see all those facilities on campus. You see all these new businesses in Waco. You see all this economic development in Waco. Well, all that came from Coach Browse leadership leading young men. And so that when 2008, when he got there, 2008, 2009, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. His responsibility was to not just Baylor. It was to every parent, every young man, every child coming through there. And there there, there was going to be a bad apple here or there and something was going to happen. It was just, you know, being able to understand, okay, you know, okay, you got one or two bad ones. But what about the other four, five, hundred, six, seven hundred great ones that are now leading, you know, all businesses? They are now leading financial institutions. They are now head coaches. They are now offensive coordinators. They're now uh, at high schools coaching. I mean, the list goes on of what all these men are doing, including myself. Sorry, a little long winded there, but no, no, it's a great answer. I, I'm, and you know, th- there was no pre-interview with Jason. I did not know what he was going to say. This has been awesome, Jason. Then, having seen what happened to Coach Browse at Baylor having seen him scapegoated for a problem that is college campus wide, not unique to Baylor, but college campus wide, and somehow Baylor uh, scapegoats, the Board of Regents scapegoats, Art Browse and his football program, as a Baylor alum, how, how have you felt about what has happened to Coach Art Browse? So as a Baylor alum, as a, as a football Hall of Famer at Baylor, as somebody who has Baylor tattooed on his arm, somebody who's, you know, I, I consider myself the foundation of the program. Uh, you know, I'm like, hey, if you're going to build a building, you know, you got to dig down and restructure the ground. You know, the Bible talks about how no man's going to build a building on sand. You know, you want to make sure that's a good foundation. So I believe I was that foundation. But I, I, it's, it's really uh, embarrassing um, to and really – it's embarrassing and it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm make sure I use the right words. It's childish and it hurts to see number one, you know, although there is a business going on, 
they're Baylor is an institution, but me and they're on the board of regents to not take responsibility for their own actions and to pass the blame on a, a prosperous program and to watch it crumble a man's reputation, his life, his legacy. I mean, going all the way back to Stephenville days, you know, coaching football for the love of the game in high school, and then, you know, working his way up in the industry, you know, and going to U of H, then coming to Baylor, winning Big 12. I mean, I played at Baylor. We, we, we couldn't win more than three games until Coach Browse got there. Now they're winning Big 12 championships. Now, you know, great job, Coach Aranda, but you're in somebody else's house doing it. And there's a lot of that that people forget. They, they don't, they, they just, you know, then you got, uh, the, what is it, Title Nine or Chapter Nine, they're trying to cover up that Baylor didn't have over this sex thing. Instead of just taking the blame. You know, if it's over your endowment or if it's over your whoever you want to be the president or whatever problems Baylor had going on, you know, stand up, be a man, take the blame. If there's something you need to fix, well, then you got to fix it. But don't just pass the blame on somebody else and then say, uh, you know, it, it's his life. It's, now his, his life is still affected seven years later. You know, seven, what is it, seven years later, he's, he's going to, to, can't get, you know, re in reality, can't get a job because some millionaire or billionaires uh, running a, a, a big institution, you know, made him the scapegoat. And we see it all the time. I mean, it's just, just happening. And for this to continue to keep going and, and, and be the, the story of the headlines. And I, I saw Stephen A. on TV the other day talking a bunch of mess like he knows anything about it. You know, he wants to come to Grambling. I would like to meet him in Grambling and tell him to his face, you know, and tell him the truth. You don't know half of what you're talking about. You're just making up something to get likes on Twitter. That's what the world's become. You know, our brother's a real man with real life issues. Stephen A., you're on TV saying what you want to say, being emotional. That's what's wrong. A bunch of emotional people saying what they want to say and people listening to it. Hope that makes sense. Uh does it make sense, JC? Uh, if the coaching thing doesn't work out, I think you have a career in broadcasting. Oh, uh, no, if, if <laughs> all, all he does is speak the truth. Thank you. I, just I love you, Jason. They may not. I mean, hey, uh, I, they may receive this interview and never accept me back at better. The truth is, it's just it's the truth, though. It's the reality. Yeah, you tell the truth. That's why I love you. Let your yeses be yeses. Your no be no's. And your no's be no's. <laughs> that's, that's right. Jason, one more question. I'm going to let you get out of here and get back to work. I got if all day, you Coach. Could, <laughs> if, if you could talk to the school president at Grambling or Doug Williams, one of their all-time great players, and, and I have a lot of respect for Doug. I think he's a good person. Uh, but I, I think he's made a mistake here. But if, if you could talk directly to them, what would you tell them about how they've, in our view, mishandled this Art Brow situation and the value he could bring to those kids at Grambling? I would, um, I would reference a few things that, that our Lord has taught us. Uh, tribulation works patience, Romans fifth chapter. Tribulation works patience. Patience, experience, and experience hope and hope make it not a shame. So what I would say about Coach R. Browse is, is the value in what he's went through allows him to bring value to your university so you don't have to go through the same thing by him being able to be uh, um, proactive with your policies, your procedures, your development of your institution, your development of your players, things like that, that he's been there, done that, and seen that. And with all due respect, I don't know much about Grambling, but they're not, they didn't win the national championship and they're not the name brand caliber school you want to go to where in reality, we've seen our brows do that. And he has the knowledge, the experience, the ability and the name to do that. Okay. Then on the other side, I would, I would remind them, okay, that um, there was a woman that was caught in the act of adultery that they brought to Jesus feet. And then there was uh, the, the Pharisees or Sadducees, one of them, they said, Hey, Jesus, this woman has been, caught in the act of adultery, okay? And then Jesus stopped what he was doing. He kneeled down and started writing in the sand. And then they said it to him again. He looks up. He said, okay, well, you that are without sin, cast the first stone, okay? And so then he looked up. He saw, where did all your accusers go? To the woman. The woman says, I have none. He said, neither do I accuse thee. He said, go and sin no more. Okay, so what Jesus was teaching us in this situation was how we're supposed to, even if, even if we do see a man sin and it's not unto death, that we are to correct them. We are to inspire them, but at the same time, we're supposed to love them and bring them in so that, that we can move on. 
So what what's happening is there are people that are passing judgment. And if we were to just kind of crawl around in their closet or crawl around what they got going on, we'd probably find the same thing. And so what I'm saying is, I don't know those guys are grambling, but what I'm saying is they you're taking something you know nothing about and you're making a big scene about it or a dose about it and you're missing your opportunity to watch your uh, your um, your institution be changed or watch your institution be grown or be elevated and you're just going to remain in the same standard or situation you're in. If that was, if they were so great, why they just hire, I believe his name is Coach Hugh Jackson, they just hired a brand new coach. But the reason why they hired a brand new coach, it was to change their program and change their winning and change their men. Okay, so the reason why you hired Coach Brown, or Brock, why, did, why did Hugh Jackson bring Coach Brown? Because he has experience in doing that, changing men, changing your program, changing your institution, bringing value to your institution, bringing uh, donors, bringing money money to your institution. Um, does uh, Little things like this. Does Grambling have an indoor? Probably not. Better than have one. Our brows come, people bring money. Boom, have an indoor. New facility. Okay, you look shinier. Now people want to listen to you, what you got to say. But, uh, you know, Grambling is not a school personally I'd want to go to. Uh, just because of where it's at. It's in Western Louisiana. Well, you bring a, uh, a Hugh Jackson, you bring Art Browns, there are people with experience um, you know, that can honestly just take your children, your young men, and, and turn them, actually, really, take your boys and develop them and train them into men. That's what Art Browns will do, can do, has done. And it's not just about this little situation here. I mean, look at his proof in the pudding, going all the way back to, what, the 80s when it was at Stevenville High School. I mean, how many guys from Stephenville High School went on to be great college players that went on to be great NFL players that are now owning businesses, that have staff, that have employees, um, that are, you know, the anchors of the United States of America? Stephenville from U of H, from Baylor. So those guys made a big mistake, you know, and I don't know them. Um, I don't, I'm not in their shoes. I don't have their job. I don't have their roles. But, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm assuming that, they might not have much of a backbone where they allow what people think to weigh, to waver their institutional values, the institutional where they could take this institution, the men, the program, the facilities, the day-to-day operations. I mean, until you, until you are around Coach Brown every day, you, you probably don't realize what you're lacking in life as a man. It's just that simple. I've been around some good men that talk the talk, but – our brows walk the walk, and he's going to surround himself, and he's going to bring men in around you that are going to walk the walk. Hope that makes sense. All right. Uh, I'm going to shorten your answer to Gramley's missing their blessing. They God missed the was big sending them a blessing, yep. and they just missed it. Yep. Jason, the next thank you so I much for the time. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. 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 No, about thank you, you so on. much for the time. Art, I'll give you the last word with Jason. He, he never, never ceases to amaze me. I Love bless you. Jason. Love you. Love you. All right. Love Thank you. you, Jason. All right. We're going to take another break. Uh, get your Fearless Army swag, shopblazemedia.com. All right. Now we're going to get into some of these, the rest of Art Browser's historic coaching career. All right. We must exist in a state of man glorious as we are protected by the red, the white, and the blue. But remember, the mind is the key. The fearless soldier pledges to place God first and foremost in his everyday endeavors of life. We, the fearless army, are one nation under God, indivisible, with freedom and a belief in the American dream. The men bold enough to join our movement comprise what we like to call the new dream team. We are leaders of our families, our churches, and of this nation. We reject the seeds of division that are planted by corporate media misinformation. We affirm that all men are created equal and are endowed with inalienable rights which are granted by our Heavenly Father. We are bound by honor to accept God's challenge, 
to take the flag and lead, to cherish, to protect, and to nurture the life of our unborn seed. I am a fearless soldier, so shed no tears for me. I am not a victim. I am the man that God made me to be. Amen. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're going to continue our conversation with Art Browles. Uh, Art, uh, Jason Smith, really impressive. And you didn't spend a lot of time with him, but man, you had an incredible impact on him. Uh, he sounds like he might be a great coach someday. Oh, he's, as you got to see, Jason, he's just real, you know, and that's that's what I always appreciated about him, and I, we kind of said it there at the end. I mean, one of his sayings was, let your yeses be yeses and your noes be noes. So let's don't fool around. Let's just tell the truth and know where we stand. But he's awesome. I mean, he's such a, such a complete person, and, and I'm so happy that he's in the profession now. You know, I was talking to him back in the fall, and, you know, he was saying, Coach, I want to get in. Tell me how to do it, how to go about it. And so I, you know, I got him up with Coach Clements, who is his old line coach at Baylor. Actually, is he's been at Florida State, been at Ole Miss lately. Now he's at North Texas, and uh, and so he's he's going up there and helping them. But he, yeah, I mean, if my grandson wants to go play left guard for Jason Smith someday, or or wherever Jason Smith's at, then he's there, you know, because that Jason, as you saw, I mean, it's. You ain't got to wonder about what's going on, what he's thinking, where you're looking, what his thoughts are, you know, how he's going to be. It's all right there in front of you. And that's what I love about it. He'll be a great addition to this profession. Well, uh, speaking of great Baylor football players, uh, you probably had the pleasure of coaching the best one, uh, RG3. And am I right in thinking that Robert Griffin was was he going to Houston with you originally and then followed you to Baylor? Yes, sir. Yeah. What did you know when you were bringing him to Houston that he had the kind of potential and could be that dynamic in college and then the number two overall pick? Did you see that? Strangely, you could ask him. You could ask Robert. So I don't want to. You know, if you got a horn, you'd want to toot it yourself, but. I actually told him in high school, I said, you will win the Heisman Trophy. I told him because I, I'm a track guy. I've been around track all my life. And when I saw Robert run in high school, and then, you know, he set national record, of course, and the 300s and the highs. And then he came to a camp we had in Houston. And, and we'd had Kevin Cobb, who was the first pick of the Eagles in the 2007 draft. He started for us at U of H and did a great job. And so we were <clears throat> a little bit in transition. We had Case Keenum already on campus. I offered Case, you know, when he was a sophomore in high school, I was actually the only offer he ever got. Now he's had a great college career and NFL career. But I saw something in Case, you know, that I don't think others saw. I just thought he had great instinct. He was throw a beautiful ball from zero to 30. And he was a fearless leader. Great Christian, fearless leader. And then I get Robert. And he comes to our camp, and I knew he could run. You know, I, I knew he could run. But I, I saw him throw one time in a drill, and we got 250, 300 kids there. And he's in the quarterback line. There's about 50 there. And so I'm telling him to get up front. You know, I watched him throw one time. I said, you're done. I said, do not throw another pass. I said, I don't want anybody else to see how good you could throw a football. <laughs> because I knew, I knew he could run. I mean, you can teach a person to throw, you can't teach them to run. And I, I know you can grit your teeth, clench your fist, you ain't gonna run any faster if you ain't fast. You know, so Robert could run. But when I saw him throw, and I knew he was graduated eighth out of 473 in his high school, had a mother and father that were both military, just a driven soul that wanted to excel, that was extremely intelligent, and was that talented and could throw the football at the quarterback position because nobody's recruiting him as quarterback. You know, that was the deal. They thought he's a safety receiver. And, you know, I thought, you know, it's just like at high school. What, you know, you talk about Xavier Howard, who's Miami, played high school quarterback. Where do you put your best players unless you're at a dynamic 6A school? They're playing quarterback or they're playing wide receiver most of the time in high school. And when I, 
when I saw him, and I hate to get excited like I'm getting excited, but there's, there's just, he's just a difference. He's a difference maker. You know, he's an X factor. And um, thank goodness, you know, we got to ride with him, and, and he got to be the, the face of the program. He got to win the Heisman, and he helped us do some things that had never been done there before. We beat Oklahoma for the first time since the earth started. And, you know, and then we, you know, beat Texas, you know, two years in a row with him. And so, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we're relevant. So when I left Houston, took the Bader job, uh, actually Robert called me, you know, because he was coming to U of H. Yeah. He called me and he said, Coach, I heard you're going to Baylor. And I said, yes, sir. He said, let's go. And I said, Joe, come on, let's go. <laughs> so he said, I'm in. And so we're. That's just how so, he was a midterm guy. You guys had things going well at Houston, but Roberts were betting on you to turn things around. I mean, Baylor's reputation at that time, Roberts going to win a bunch of games at Houston, yeah. and Lord knows what's going to happen at Baylor, but I guess he believed in you and your offense that much? I think so. I think it's just, I think his mother and father were both instrumental, you know, and, and, and they're like I said, they came and watched tape. They're very intellectual. Robert, I always like to teach the intellectual side of the game. Robert really loved that part of it. And I just think they had a belief. You know, it's just like Jason Smith. I mean, sometimes you just believe in people. And I believed in Robert, and I think he believed in me. So I think he, he was going to go to where we were going to be because he thought that was the best opportunity for him to excel. And he was right. I know the injury in the pros, but is in your mind, is the injury, the torn ACLs, is that the only reason Robert didn't have a long, illustrious NFL career? I think, I mean, you, you talked about it earlier with, uh, I can't really remember the situation, but you talked about, I think it was Doug Williams. Yeah, Doug yeah. Williams being in the proper situations. Yes. You know, and that's, that's what it's all about. I mean, you, you gotta be in a system and around people that, and, and that's why high school coaching is so great to me, because you coach who walks through the door. So, you know, you got a system, oh, your system doesn't matter. If they can't do what you want, then you're not going to win. So you got to adapt, you got to adjust. And actually, when we were at, at Baylor, um, Sean McAfee or the coach of the Rams. Yeah, Sean, yeah, Sean McVay. McVay, yeah, he came and spent a week there because they'd just drafted him in Washington. And he was like a tight end coach or something there at the time. And he came there, tried to, they, he said, I, I want to be here. They sent me down there to try to see how to use Robert, how to, you know, because he's different now. And the thing I told Robert, you know, two or three things. First of all, he came out early. You know, he still had another year left. And I was all for it. I said, you, you were? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. What about, the, what about the theory that the more starts you have in college, the better pro – seriously. He's, I started him as a true freshman. <laughs> so he's, he's playing. He had a lot of no, he ain't there. sitting. Gotcha. So, uh, you know, I, so I said, don't, you know, don't chase your dreams. Go catch it. And then, uh, you know, the, the thing that concerned me is, is I know Robert. You know, I still know him today. And uh, he's a fierce, fierce competitor. Fierce. And I said – you got to learn to step out of bounds. You got to learn to get down. Because I said in the NFL, it's all about longevity. I said, you don't need to make that play for that game unless it gets you in the Super Bowl or it's in the Super Bowl. Because I, I just know him. I know his personality. And I know that he will, he'll take that awkward hit when he could slide and get down. And, you know, it just, you know, I, I, I still remember watching the injury. Uh, in the playoff game at Washington. He was NFL Rookie of the Year, if, I, if I'm yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. And it was a 2012 football season. I think it was on a Sunday night because I was at an AFCA convention in January, and I stayed in my room by myself and watched it on TV. And when I saw him get hit down around the end zone, uh, you know, I told myself, he's, he's hurt. And then he goes sideline, they, they discuss, talk a little bit, goes back in, and... Uh, you know, it's and, – and you can you can operate on a torn ACL, but you can't play on You can – I can walk from here to you, but I, I, I'm in danger myself if I do anything else. And – but that's that's the fierceness and competitiveness that he felt like he had to show at that time. And that, 
That was my greatest fear for him because I knew he was a 10 to 15 year guy if he played by the book. But I it, thought he could have been Steve Young. And oh, Steve oh, Young's one yeah. of the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history. Yeah. He reminds me of Steve Young. Uh, they're about the same size. Intellectual. Steve Young was lightning fast, yep. very accurate. Steve was left handed. And so I'm watching that Seattle game, and I, I wrote a column. And again, it, 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 I thought, and you know, obviously know Robert. I don't know Robert, but watching that game, I was like, Robert's got to pull himself out of this game. He's hurt, and he's hurting his team. I felt like Shanahan was caught in a position where he couldn't pull Robert from the game. He didn't have the leverage. Robert had the leverage. Right. The owner loved him. <laughs> yeah. yes, and, and so I thought the responsibility and the burden was on Robert to tap out and protect himself. And I thought it would have given his team a better shot because he seemed so wounded. Yeah. But you see now why he didn't. Because I can still remember him, them talking on the sidelines, and I can see Mike saying, Robert, can you go? And, and it, the answer is going to be yes. You know, the answer is going to be yes. And Do you think you would have pulled him from that game? Not to second guess Mike Shanahan. <laughs> well, I think you'd have to be in that situation. I think it was their first playoff game, maybe. Yep. Five, I, I don't know. You know, Jason, yep. maybe five or six years, I don't know. And so they're kind of hot, you know, Robert's Rookie of the Year and all this stuff. And, and you can get caught up in a situation being on the inside where you don't look at things like you would being on the outside. And so when you're between the lines, that, that's, all you, that's all your focus is, is what's going on between the lines. And a lot of times it's easy, not excusable, but it's easy to not look past that second uh, to the next one. Hmm. That, that, that's... He was clear. He was rookie of the year. He was the talk of the league. Um, you know, you know, not this is not a shot at Lamar Jackson, but he was like a throwing Lamar Jackson. And it's really kind of sad that he didn't get to uh, live that out. And, and so do, do you think Robert comes off on TV really well? And uh, it ain't no come off. It's him. Okay. I mean, yeah, he's just he's just good. Yeah, he and I I'd coach Lamar Jackson too, by the way, because <laughs> once once again he can run. Yeah, now, I'll get I'll get that throwing part down, but he can run. <laughs> so uh -huh. he, he gonna make you look good <laughs> most of the time. Uh, and so I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna leave the whole <laughs> RG three thing alone because I, here's another interesting guy you coach that. Incredible talent, Josh Gordon. Yep. Uh, it's kind of a he didn't get to live up to his pro potential. D did you see? Were you guys dealing with those issues with Josh when he was in college in terms of? Oh sure. The, yeah. How? What was that like, or or what? How did you guys manage that? I, I have a lot of respect for Josh. And, and always have, he, he is extremely intelligent. Um, you know, I, I think the, it's shown that he has an addictive uh, problem. You know, we tried, I tried hard. You know, I knew when we signed him that he'd be a three and done guy. He was one of the most talented people I'd ever seen, still is. You know, just, just, just awkwardly talented. Just, you just don't, you can't explain it. The size. So a lot of people have said the same thing about me, but go ahead. And that's, and that's really why he, you know, <laughs> why he's still around because he, and he's such a good person. You know, he's, he's a great person. Um, you know, he just, he has a, he has a little problem with weed, but, uh, you know, we tried hard to, to help him get him through it and just couldn't, couldn't hang on, couldn't keep him in the university. You know, he goes to Utah, yeah. uh, transfers there. Could have gone anywhere he wanted. Um, and then, you know, doesn't ever really play there, I don't think. And then I remember, uh, you know, getting calls from NFL head coaches, numerous, uh, saying, what do you think? And I said, you know, if, if y'all think y'all can take care of him, take him. And he was the, the second highest supplemental draft pick in the history of the NFL. I think the first was Steve Walsh and Josh Gordon's second. 
So tremendous talent and, and just a, a good, kind-hearted person. And that's, that can get lost sometimes in everything else, but Josh is a very good human being. You had a defensive back, Xavier Howard, who's, I mean, you brought in some real talent, man. <laughs> what do you remember about? I'll oh, just, <laughs> everything. Carlton Buckles recruiting him out of Houston ISD. I think it was Sterling High School. And of course he played high school quarterback, so he wasn't, wasn't heavily recruited uh, because he played high school quarterback and he really wasn't a quarterback, he was just the best player they got. And they snapped him ball and he ran all over the place and did great, you know. And so we looked at him and we said, hey, this, this guy's different. You know, he's different now. And he's, he was kind of lost in the shuffle a little bit by being in HISD as far as to outside universities nationally. You know, they'll come in there and hit. What's this H? Houston Independent School District. Got you. I'm sorry. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so he was, he was in the Houston Independent School District, uh, which at this time, years ago, it was really prominent, you know, and Michael Shanahan, I think, has come from there. Uh, you know, knew some great, great players have come out of there. But Michael Strahan? Michael Strahan. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I still well, think about the Mike coach. Shanahan? <laughs> He's not HISD. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Strahan. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so he's in there, and, and we get him. And just, you know, he's just uh, he's a natural. He's good, and he's, just, and he's got great ball skills from playing quarterback in high school. And that's why he's a great DB. That's why he gets the picks and all that, because he's handled football all his life. You know, the, the knack on DBs is that most of them, you know, don't have fluid, fluid hands. Well, yeah. X, X Man does. And another great kid that we're extremely proud of. As, as dynamic as the players you, you've worked with, at one time, I believe you were on a staff that included Mike Leach. Dana Holgerson, uh, I'm forgetting a couple other. Uh, I can run down them. Please. Oh, uh, Sonny, Sonny Dykes. Dykes, Cliff Kingsbury. Cliff played. Oh, Cliff, Cliff played. Player. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ruffin McNeil, Robert and I, Brian Norwood, uh, Manny Mensakis. This is at Texas Tech. We're all at Texas Tech. Yeah. That was a year, that was 2000. That's when I left high school and went to be an assistant at Tech. And so, when was the first moment when you Actually, said... Actually, Mike Singletary was HISD, too. I, I better throw that in there. Yeah, you better he, throw that. Yeah, that's yeah, a good one. That's a good one. That's, a, that's, that's an all-time great as yes, well. Yes, he got uh, some guys. So, was there ever a moment early on joining the Texas Tech staff where you said, man, Mike Leach is a little different? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the moment I didn't say that. <laughs> oh, we'd be talking a while. But uh, no, you know, that, the great thing about that job, and I'd, I'd coached high school 21 years prior to that, never been in college, uh, and they, they wanted a Texas guy on there because all these guys at the time, even Sonny was coming from, I think, Kentucky or Valdosta State or somewhere. Uh, so they needed a Texas coach in there to, you know, relate to the Texas high school coaches and student athletes. You know, I, could, I knew where you know, Spur, Texas was, and I knew where, you know, Tyler was. I, I know the whole state, so they needed that. But, you know, Mike and Co Gerald Myers, they, they, they put together staff now. When I was there, I was thinking, these guys are good. This is a good staff, and, and we, we really had good people. You know, that's, we, went, we had Kingsbury and then went on from there, Wes Welker, all those guys. When, when you and Mike Leach – or talking offense, and, and I'm sure obviously it's a lot of sharing of ideas, but did he have significant influence on your offense and mindset about offense and the style you eventually took to Houston and, and, and Baylor, and how much influence do you think you had on him? You know, strangely, I, uh, you know, the offense, the run and shoot, or the air, air raid, yeah. is, is a, it's a Hal Bumby offense, which Mike got under Hal at I Wesleyan, I think years ago, went to Kentucky, Valdosta State. They were all together. Dana was with them through all that. Sonny with a bunch of it, and I think uh, uh, Coach Leach and Robert and I were together at BYU together. Robert's a great offensive line coach. That's now the OC at Syracuse. Great man, great friend, 
And all those guys are really good friends, I mean, to this day. I mean, Coach Norwood, I hired as uh, my defense coordinator at Baylor initially when I first got the job. Uh, but, you know, I, I've always been a run guy, Jason, to, for the most part. You know, if you check the stats through the years, um, you know, we'll always try to be a top 10 team rushing the ball nas nationally. You look at Houston, look at Baylor. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a throw to run offense, you know, so we're going to, we're going to throw the ball to set up the run, which is just opposite of what most people do. And so I, we're, we're, we're going to rush the football, and, and we're, going to, we're going to, you know, make you play – we're going to make you play defense, tackling the ball. The <clears throat> – and, you know, I follow college football pretty closely. When I think of Art Browns, I think of – RG3 in passing for some reason. And I know RG3 was a great runner as well. But it's funny because even in our private conversations, I heard you talk about run, run, run. And, and like when I think of a running coach, I think of Marty Schottenheimer. And <laughs> well, or whoever's coaching at Army and Navy and yeah. Georgia Tech. Or, or just, you know, I, I, and so it, it's funny to hear you. So, because I, 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 I think of you like as like a different version of Mike Leach, and so clearly my impression is wrong. Uh, do, do, do am I the only one that makes that mistake? No, not at all. And I, I and like when you said I think RG three in the deep ball, I want to say thank you because that's really the impression that we want everybody to think because we want them to think that we're going to be a high flying offense that just throws the ball recklessly all over the field, but in reality. If it's third and three, we can run the ball and make three yards. If it's first and ten, we can get to second and eight running the football. So we will rush the football. And a prime, just quick example, is Terrence Ganaway, who was our running back in 2010, 11, <clears throat> was the MVP. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting, I'm getting going talking football. I'm MVP of the Alamo Bowl, uh, where he rushed for, I don't know, 180, 200 yards. The year Robert won the Heisman. Robert won the Heisman, came back. And we actually beat Washington. Uh, Sarkeesian was the coach there then in the in the Alamo Bowl, like 56 to 35 or something. But I, w I think if you pulled your stats up, Ganaway was the MVP and probably had close to 200 yards rushing. Of course, so, we had 777 yards of offense that day. Last week, uh, and last weekend I had some friends of mine, college teammates in town. One of them was here for – a coaching clinic. Uh, he's a high school coach in Phoenix and very, you know, I think it's not Gorman, Hamilton, Hamilton High School in, in, in Phoenix, powerhouse school, you know, nationally ranked, turn out a lot of prospects. And so they were telling me about, they went to some, the hit, the offensive coordinator coaches the offensive line and he went to one of the seminars about offensive line play and blah, blah, blah. And so as they were describing to me, and again, I watch a lot of college football and I see it, I just see how much the game has changed in terms of offensive linemen, the game isn't as physical as it used to be. So much zone blocking, so much mirroring. And, and so I literally, when I listened to them, I was like, I would have had zero value because I was a very physical, I'm a pancake guy. Punch. Uh -oh. I'm a headbutt you. Punch. I like I'm gonna it. try to beat you. Play for me. Yeah. Oh, is that is that what y'all were doing? Be physical. I tell you, but it, it really the offensive. You know, quick quick point. I mean, I've always started our team with O line D line because to me that's that's where you win the football game. There's there's little fast guys everywhere, but you've got to have men up front on both sides of the ball. I mean, that, that's who runs the locker room, who runs your team. And when it's fourth and one, you're not throwing it out to a wide out. You, you're gonna, you have to make a yard, you have to stop a yard. So that's, that's where your men have to be. But impressions like you're talking about, and I, I thought about when I was talking about the Alamo game, you know, the perception, well, in, in the, the history of bowl games, you can check this again also, but I think we've had the most yards passing in a game, like 600 plus yards in 2015 against Michigan State. And then the most yards rushing in a bowl game was like 548 yards, um, actually the same year because we played in January 1st in December versus North Carolina. 
Uh, so, so we're going to do both is what I'm trying to get to. We're not just going to throw it and not run it. We're not just going to run it and not throw it. We're going to do both. And so that's what makes you special, honest to goodness, because it seems like everybody else is kind of choosing sides. We're going to figure out the best way according to our personnel. And that's, that's really why I've never had a playbook or anything. I've got play sheets that I've got all the way back from the late 70s, early 80s. That I have that I keep, but everything else is uh, mentally, repetitionally, and it's on the board, and it changes due to personnel and situations. Hmm. Huh. Never. Uh, story. You recruited Wes Walker to Texas Tech. Yes, sir. I what, <laughs> what did you know? It didn't have to beat anybody. I think he had Tulsa. That's the only scholarship offer I believe he had. That was. Uh, that's only what I remember. Tommy McVeigh, who worked in the office there and grew up in Oklahoma, brought me a tape and said, hey, I want you to watch this guy. And this was like in January, and I'd just, just gotten there. And I, I put it on, and he's at a, a, a private school in Oklahoma City, Heritage Hall. So you, you're thinking, ah, this, I don't know about this caliber of competition. You know, so you're watching, he, he's quarterback, he's running back, he's free safety, he's a kicker, he's a kick returner, he's a punter, he's a punt returner, he's an exploit field goal kicker. And so he's doing everything, and he's doing it extremely well. And I, I said, what, what's the deal on this guy? And he says, well, he's a good athlete over in, in Oklahoma. I said, what's his, you know, I said, what's his size? You know, he said, well, he's, you know, so-and-so, and what does he run? Oh, you know, they said high, high four, five, low four, six, which I'm thinking is always inflated because they're not going to talk down, you know. Yeah. Um, but then I go see him and I meet him and go to the hallway and talk to his coach and watch him interact with students and walk down the hall with him and stuff and what the coach has to say about him. Saw the kind of person he was and saw how hot he burned and saw how quick he was in a two-foot box, you know. I mean, he's always one of those guys that never been hit and tagged, you know. So he, he's kind of that guy, you know what I mean, because his, his lateral movement explosiveness is kind of off the chain. And so we get in there really as a running back. We're thinking, you know, this guy can play black. We had Ricky Williams, had Shad Williams. You know, Ricky's a great back. Shad went to uh, Alabama and finished up his career, now coaching at Oregon. Uh, but uh, so he gets there and, and said, well, let, let's let him return kicks. He returns kicks, wins us a couple of games, a and game in overtime, uh, then starts playing receiver and just, you know, if you get the ball close to him, he catches it. And he can't be covered in an inside route position, you know, by a safety or a linebacker. You know, just ex extreme explosiveness, and a guy that uh, you know has a burning desire to be great. And and I think he's coached from San Francisco now. Last time I talked to him, but he's 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 done a great job, and I'm extremely proud of him. But yeah, that's one of my small claims to fame. <laughs> it's not not quite recruiting Brady. I mean, uh, Tom Brady but uh, someone that helped Tom Brady <laughs> a yeah. lot. So uh, th that's a good one to have on your resume. Someone you didn't coach, but you coached against. I'm wondering if you saw what has been revealed in the NFL when you had to coach against Patrick Mahomes. Uh, did did oh. you, you see? No, we said it. I, I, was, I say he's the best player in the Big 12, no doubt, hands down. He was as different a football player. He's, he's an RG3 type because if the ball's in his hands, if he's on the field, you always have a chance to win the game. You're never out of a football game. He, he is, as, as we've all seen by what he's done with Coach Reed and Eric and them in Kansas City, I mean, it's, uh, he's phenomenal. He, he's, a, he's a talent level that's uh, unheard of. I'm going to tell you, the point that I like that you made is, is that you said like RG3, and this goes back to, do you get in the right situation? Patrick Mahomes gets to play for Andy Reid. There you go. That, that's like, that's the overweight Art Browse. That's he's, uh, he's, <laughs> he's, And I say that with oh, affection. He is great for QBs. He's a man. Yeah. You can ask Kevin Cobb, Michael Vick, you know, you got Mahomes, I guess Andy Smith. Uh, Alex Smith, Alex yeah. Smith. So, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, if you started with a G and it ends with a U, that'd be Andy Reid with quarterbacks. 
If that's how you spell guru. guru. I mean, yeah, it is. I mean, it you're, is. It you're is. The smart guy, Jason. I, I'm, the I'm the journalist. I, I write for a living. That is how you spell guru. Thank you. And so, do you remember anything specific in your competition or anything you saw while scouting Patrick Mahomes? Any? Just don't don't pressure him. And don't do pressure. pressure. Oh. <laughs> Either way, it didn't matter. If you pressure him, he scrambles around, he's falling sideways, he makes a 40-yard throw right before he hits the ground. If you don't pressure him and he stands there, then, you know, he's looking here, but he's throwing here. So it, it tears up your zone principles, you know. So it's, he's, he was impossible to beat, but strangely didn't have a lot of success uh, collegiately. You know, I mean, they just – they were kind of in, in a, you know – 500 range in there. Now, the conference was, was really good, but Mahomes kept them. I mean, one game, you know, we stopped a two-point play and beat them 48-46. I mean, just it's just that kind of deal. And, and, if, and like I said, if he's on the field and you're wearing red and black at Texas Tech, you feel like you got a chance to win today. The reason I brought up or heard your RG3 comment and made my Andy Reid point is, do you think RG3 – was as good as Patrick Mahomes? Uh, unquestion- there's, there's no question. Might ask it the other way. But, and I, because I'm a little biased, yeah. I, I know Pat, he's an East Texas guy from, I think, White House, Texas or somewhere, but I think you ask it, do I, do I know if RG3 is as good as Patrick? I might ask it, was Patrick Holmes ever as good as RG3? Okay, take it out of the college level. Do you think if RG3 had landed with Andy Reid or a different situation, he would have been able to have the kind of success Mahomes I think he'd be a Super Bowl champion. I think, I, and it goes back to situation, and I'm biased on that again because Andy Reid drafted our quarterback at Houston, Evan Cobb, with his first pick in the 2007 draft. So Andy conceptually uh, liked, our, liked what we did and then uh, also liked how our quarterbacks came to him or that quarterback in in particular came to him and was there. But I, I would I would guess if Andy had the pick in, in the 2012 draft and could get RG3, I, he'd be playing for Andy Reid. I don't know what his situation was back then, but that'd be my guess. So now I'm going to ask you a really tough question because uh, this week I've heard from your son and your daughter. Uh, better... Offensive coordinator, Kendall Browse or Jeff Levy? <laughs> <laughs> they better both be really, really good because they're at really great universities with great people, uh, great coaches, great support from the administration, great players. And, and so, you know, they're, they're blessed. We understand that. We understand that we're blessed. And, and they've... Jeff Levy, offensive coordinator at Oklahoma, son your son-in-law... Uh, Kendall Browse, offensive coordinator at Arkansas, your son. Yes, sir. Uh, both of them, I'm sure, grew up under your tutelage. If, if, you, if you got them in here on the board right now with me, we'd, you'd think we'd been together for 48 years because it's all the same, same verbiage, lingo, maybe a little difference here or there, but at the end of the day, it's all the same principles of attack from an offensive standpoint. So... You know, your son is kind of your son, and so he could take you for granted a little bit. Your son-in-law, one needs to impress you so that you'll bless him marrying your daughter. Was either one of them a more studious? They were both great students, obviously, but was either one of them a more passionate student learning from you in your offense? <laughs> well, they both kind of came different routes. You know, uh, Jeff, our son-in-law, uh, and his dad uh, was, he and I were best friends. You know, we started his coaching. His dad? Mm -hmm. We started coaching together in 1980 in Sweetwater, Texas. He was a basketball coach, and I was, uh, I coached quarterbacks there <clears throat> under W.T. Stapler. And then we just connected and stayed together. And unfortunately, Mike passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but so, so Jeff is our son. You know, he's, he's been around our family forever. Uh, as far as studious and, and learning, uh, you know, different, different levels with different uh, ways that they'd like to learn. I mean, Kendall's a bam, bam, bam 
get it going. Jeff likes to really uh, look at stuff and then make a decision on things. So they're both, the thing I'm proud of is, is their journey. You know, they've both had good journeys uh, since their days in Waco and, and they're, we're very blessed and fortunate where they are right now. It, it, it's, it's, I got a very good friend. Um, he was our defensive coordinator at Ball State when I was a player and then we became friends. Uh, his name is Rick Mentor. He was defensive coordinator at Notre Dame about, for about 10 years. He was the head coach at the University of Cincinnati. That's right. And he goes off uh, and one of Chip Kelly's assistants with the Eagles, had a couple other NFL jobs. But uh, he had this little bitty son that he would bring to practice at Ball State. And uh, his son just took the defensive coordinator's job in Michigan this year. Oh, God. <laughs> and, and it's the and it's a great blessing i think for you because when you and rick Miner, because rick Miner's probably around your age yeah, I, I, I know yeah, it. he's around your age and so when you guys got involved i would bet rick Miner is defensive coordinator for ball state was probably making eighty thousand dollars wasn't a money deal back in the 80s and blah 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 but but grows to be able to put your kids one just they're pursuing a profession that they love but it's so financially rewarding now uh, that's got one of the things I know that you take a lot of pleasure and there's nothing better than coaching yourself but to be able to empower and help your kids move up and have success in, in the profession you love so much and then they, they get rewarded and they're able to take care of their family. That, that's got to be damn near as good as coaching yourself. Well, it takes a lot of pressure off, off of my wife and I, you know, who we've been married 43 years. But not, not really just that, to watch them be able to empower others, you know, to help others uh, come with them and grow in the profession. And that's, that was really why I took the Mount Vernon High School job, because I got to come in there and hire 13 coaches. You know, so I got to bring some guys that I'd coached and uh, been around and, and give them a chance to get in the profession. Now one of them's the head coach there and some others, have, two others went off to be head coaches. And so that, that was, uh, that's, that's the beauty of being in a position to help others. And that's what, to me, is gratifying watching Kendall and Jeff, is let, watching them empower other people that they know are good human beings that, that trust in our offense, basically. Is it, I mean, because I've heard some dads say that watching their kids play is just as satisfying as playing yourself. Is watching your kids coach, does it come close? Both, to both, both are torturous. <laughs> Torture. I'd, 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 rather, <laughs> I'd rather be in Germany coaching in the German football league than watching a game on TV, which that's how I do it. I won't. I won't. I don't go to very few games live, uh, and then I just sit up in the stands uh, with their their wives and watch the game. But uh, it's it's hard. You know, it's hard because you care. So anytime you care, you know, it makes it difficult. Um, and being a coach, also, you know, you, I, I don't watch a game for enjoyment. I watch it from a situationally schematic, you know, standpoint that. Uh, other people might not, you know, pay that close attention to. So that that part of it is how I always evaluate and then try to to give my uh, non non asked for feedback at the end of the end of the day. But it, it's it's hard. It's hard to watch. So I was. I'll, hopefully, I'll be busy this fall to where I'll have an excuse where I don't have to <laughs> say. As a head coach, and we'll wrap up here. As a head coach your most memorable victory like the f f it's like for me as a player I my most memorable game was actually a loss <laughs> wow yeah because <laughs> we played for the MAC championship and I think lost 16 to 13 to Western Michigan I think that was the score and I didn't play that well I had to play against a guy named Joel Smingy who when he retired from the NFL after like 12 I think he was Jacksonville's leading sacker or whatever wasn't a good day for me. <laughs> Going against Aaron Donald today. <laughs> but 
What's your most memorable moment in coaching? It could be Baylor, Houston, high school. What? what? I'll hit it right quick. Uh, you know, I, um, <laughs> I, I've got. I'll go through high school, college. Yeah, if that's okay. I'll make yeah. it fast. Uh, no, take your time. No, I mean uh, at uh, probably Hammond High School, 1980, 84 football season, beating Haskell on the road, 15 to 14, to get us in the playoffs. Then going to Stephenville, and actually, well, at Coppers Cove, when I was at Georgetown, uh, Hal Mummy was head coach at Coppers Cove, and I was the head coach at Georgetown High School. Both of them in uh, Texas area, around Austin, and we beat them 20 to 19 uh, on a this field goal right there, the game, I actually kind of thought it went in, but they called it, said it said it's wide. But uh, that was probably Dude. there against Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Hmm. And then um, at Stephenville, probably beating Brownwood High School, which is a legendary uh, Texas high, won more state champions than hardly anybody in the state of Texas. It had been 27 years since Stephenville had beaten them. And I, it was my third year at Stephenville, and we uh, – we beat them 42 to 24 in 1990, so that was a huge win just to give us a step up to where we felt like we belonged. And you have to have a statement win to, to where your players, community, alumni, whatever you're dealing with, feel like, hey, you know, maybe maybe we can do this. And then at U of H, uh, uh, probably beating uh, Southern Miss in the championship game. They'd beaten us earlier in the year at Southern Miss. And then we played them in championship game in 2006. Uh, so just first time Houston won an outright championship since like 89. That was in 2006. And then, of course, at Baylor, it, it'll surprise you a little bit because it's a game nobody knows about. But it, it changed. Beating Kansas, I remember that. Yeah, yes, sir. No, oh, don't say that. 2011, beating Kansas. Turner Gill's the head coach. Turner's a good friend of mine. And they're and I and and they've got us down 21 with 10 minutes left in the ball game. We're going into about a. Have you ever been to Kansas? Yeah. Probably 28, 35 mile per hour wind, and we're down 21 points. We score 21 unanswered, tied up, get into overtime. We score on a little to Tevin Reese, Robert Tevin Reese, and this is Robert's Heisman year, and that's why it's so important. No, no TV. It was on the radio. Yeah, there's probably twenty three thousand there. Heisman Trophy year, uh, and we're five and two at the time. And Kansas is like you know, not very three, good. Four, two and five. Yeah. Anyway, we hit Tevin Reese for a touchdown kick. There's point go up uh, twenty eight twenty one. They score, and then uh, Turner Turner goes for two, and we have a, a DB Joe Williams knocks a knocks a pass away for the two-point. We end up beating them. Then Robert goes on. We beat Oklahoma. We beat Texas down the stretch. Beat Washington bowl game. He wins the Heisman. If, if we don't win that game, none of that happens. It never happens. And my theory, and I love Turner. Turner's a great man, a great coach. But in my mind, he was chasing the two-point play from Nebraska when he was the starting quarterback in the national championship game from 20 years prior. That's just me thinking. I, you'd have to ask Turner. But, you know, that's something as a coach that happens. You know, if you're, if you're a coach, you remember these situations that were prevalent in your coaching career, playing career, and you always want to overcome them. You know, you always want to take that out of there. And to me, you know, uh, you know, by them going for two right there, which I think is a smart call because, you know, it would have been a major upset. Not major, it had been, been an upset, big up. but we weren't. We, Any Kansas victory is an upset <laughs> well, and a major but, victory. But anyway, that's what You hit it, Jason. I, can, I was cracking a joke. <laughs> no, I worked in Kansas City, no it. Kansas football, Beat, basketball. Beating Kansas in 2011 was, was the most accomplishing victory that we had in our time at Baylor. That's a good note to end on because I was not, no one, Everybody in Lawrence, Kansas will be shocked to hear that story. Oh, it's the truth. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call Bill Self and tell him uh, <laughs> that someone beating Kansas in football was a big deal. We've been looking for you. You're the guy. It was, it was that day. <laughs> Coach, really appreciate this. Um, really appreciate getting to know you. Yes, sir. Um, 
I hope people watch this, listen to this with an open mind. Uh, we just can't continue to do people like this. We can't cancel human beings. Uh, even if you had made some tragic mistake. I I've written about why Michael Vick deserves his second opportunity. I've defended Greg Hardy, the, the Cowboys defensive end, he had domestic problems. I've Joe Mixon. People deserve second chances. That's what sports in America ha have been all about. Why we think we're improving America by not allowing you to get a second chance and an opportunity. It's just crazy. And it's not right with God. Um, but, you know, what society goes as secular as America has. You know, they think they're canceling people, but they're really canceling God. They're canceling forgiveness. Yep. That's what. Christian, thank God I've been forgiven. I've done so much wrong. <sighs> thank you. God bless you. You're a true American. God bless you as well. Uh, and we'll see you tomorrow. You're a soul saver. I just want, I want to be, I just want.